How did a Spanish force of under 600 men conquer an empire of over 5 million? Today we discuss the conquest of Mexico. Hello, this is John and welcome to the September 21st episode of Footnoting History. Although labeled conquistadors or conquerors, the men who created the Spanish Empire in Mexico were ambitious members of the lower nobility known as Hidalgos, and not trained soldiers. In this sense, Hernán Cortés was not exceptional. He received some education studying Latin and law at the University of Salamanca. That he did not finish university was not a mark of a bad student, but instead a common facet of university education at the time. He certainly received enough education to begin his career as a notary in Seville. In 1502, Hernán Cortés traveled to Hispaniola, where he continued his career as a notary in the New World. However, men who wished to spend their lives as notaries stayed in Spain. They didn't travel to the New World. For most of those men, and those who decided to make the journey were overwhelmingly male, the trip was temporary. It was an adventure, meant to gain glory and fortune, and then return to Spain to settle amongst the established nobility. It was a precedent established by the Reconquista. During the Reconquista, noblemen would finance military expeditions with the approval of the king. The spoils of war, the booty, would be split between the men who fought, the commander, and the king, whose fifth was also known as the Quinto Real, and was always set aside first. Early efforts of the Spanish in the New World uncovered disappointingly little gold. The indigenous population, a potential source of wealth as forced labor, had been destroyed by disease brought over by the Europeans. Eventually, the Spanish possessions found wealth in the cultivation and production of sugar and other cash crops. But men such as Cortes had now left Europe to be farmers. Influenced by the tradition of the Reconquista and eager to make their mark, these men were noblemen, Hidalgos. Hidalgo derived from the phrase Hijo de Algo, or son of someone. They were not settlers or pobladores. Cortes, however, had to be patient. He worked his way up the bureaucracy, eventually becoming secretary to the governor of Cuba, Diego Velasquez. A secretary at this time was more than an administrative assistant. A secretary was the most powerful person in the government besides the chief executive. Secretary served as a filter for information that reached the governor, responding to correspondence and independently shaping policy at times. Cortez also became a landholder in his own right, receiving an encomienda, or the right to forced indigenous labor in exchange for their care. The expedition led by Cortes in 1518 was not the first. In 1517, three ships with a little over 100 Spaniards left Cuba on a mission of capturing slaves. The journey was financed in large part by the expedition's commander, Francisco Hernández de Cordoba, and with further support from other members and from credit. That their goal was obtaining forced labor and not precious metals is indicative of the shifting perspective on wealth of the Spanish in the Caribbean. Instead of finding a weak, indigenous population living in relatively simple conditions, Hernández de Cordoba stumbled upon a complex civilization with urban centers, complex social and political hierarchies, and most importantly, material wealth. Poorly supplied, the expedition fell victim to numerous indigenous ambushes and ended in disaster. Only one ship and over half the men who departed from Cuba returned. The majority died from either the ambushes or their wounds. Others died from dehydration. Hernández de Cordoba died only days after returning to Cuba. Cordoba, however, reported the information about the people he had found. Of particular interest was the presence of gold. The second expedition was much better attended and financed solely by Velázquez. From the Pope to the King of Spain to Velázquez, there was a general fear of the usurpation of power and wealth. In short, everyone wanted their cut. Velázquez made sure that only loyal men, who would not undermine his authority, served in positions of power on these expeditions. He selected Juan de Grijalva to command this expedition, giving him very specific orders on the limits of his command. He was to explore, and to his credit, Grijalva followed his mandate, leaving the wealth and glory of conquest for someone else to claim. By the time Grijalva returned to Cuba, the third expedition led by Hernán Cortés was being ready. Velázquez imposed limitations similar to those on Grijalva on Cortés. Where Grijalva was ex instructed to explore, Cortés was told to trade. Cortés bypassed the Yucatán, the site of Hernández de Cordoba's mishaps and Grijalva's exploration, and proceeded to the Mexican mainland where he would find the Aztec Empire. Like many empires, the Aztecs ruled over a complex network of tribute states from their capital city of Tenochtitlan. 
The capital city itself was a hub of trade for the empire, containing many marketplaces. The city held a populace of 150,000 to 200,000 people, while the empire itself had a population of between 5 and 6 million. If Cortes had faced this empire with his only meager 530 men, he would have been destroyed. But like most empires, there was conflict between the central authority and the surrounding territories. The empire itself was fairly young and imposed strict tributes on its members. Consequently, Cortes was able to rally support to his cause from the dissatisfied peoples. Cortes's first act upon arriving in Mexico was the founding of Veracruz. The founding of the town established Spanish rights to the land in practice as well as theory. During this period, claims to land were largely based on possession and improvements, such as the construction of towns. By founding the city, Cortes clearly marked Mexico as Spanish territory. However, the town and territory remained under the authority of Velasquez, who initially granted permission to the voyage. Cortes exploited a medieval Castilian law which allowed cities to reject the authority of local administrators and petition the king directly. In essence, Cortes was gambling that the wealth he would gain from the voyage and the Quinto Real that he would pay to the crown would justify his actions. Montezuma, emperor of the Aztecs, was not unaware of the potential threat that these new people posed. He almost certainly had received word of their arrival on the mainland and likely had heard of the exploits of both Hernandez de Cordoba as well as Guillavo. Later generations would accuse Montezuma of believing Cortes to have been a god and Cortes sinisterly playing along. This, however, was likely the product of oppressed descendants, eager to attack Cortes and rationalize their thorough conquest. More likely, Montezuma believed himself to be safe in his capital city. He underestimated the psychological impact of the horses and guns as well as the willingness of Cortes to take the emperor hostage. Although the Aztecs would assemble a sizable army, it was no match for the superior technology of the Spanish with the assistance of their allies. The conquest of the Aztecs was not only military. Unlike the conquest of other lands, which had been largely uninhabited or held by tribal societies who had not, in the minds of the Europeans at least, laid claim to and improved the land, the Aztecs had clear possession of their empire. They maintained trade as well as a complex social and political hierarchy. They constructed cities. Cortes took to calling the temples mosques in reference to the Muslim buildings still found in Spain. In short, the Aztecs were a civilized people whose land could not simply be taken. Cortes, therefore, obtained the formal submission of Montezuma, who recognized the king of Spain as his sovereign lord. With that submission in hand, Cortes could legally begin the process of subjugating. He was no longer a conquistador, but a governor, controlling the most lucrative discovery made in Spanish history to that point. Cortes famously told Montezuma that the Spanish had a sickness in their hearts, for which gold was the sole cure. For Cortes, at least, he had found his cure. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find further reading suggestions related to this week's podcast. You can also like us on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter, The History Footnote. Join us next week when we'll be talking about the history of gift elephants. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.